Welcome. Thank you for coming to this morning's webinar. My name is Mary Kat Boyette. I'm the program administrator here at MIT with the MIT Nord Anglia collaboration. As you all know, this is a professional development webinar and we are absolutely thrilled to have some really wonderful guests who may be familiar to you here this morning. Um, most of all, thank you for joining. We know that you're really busy and you have a lot going on as teachers wherever you may be in the world um, at various times of the day. So thank you so much for coming to join us. I'd love to introduce my guests. You all will probably recognize Caroline Umenhofer. She is um, a physical oceanographer and a professor in the MIT Woods Hole Joint Program. She is with Svenja Ryan, who is a postdoc at um, in the program at HUI, so we call Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute HUI. Um, Caroline was a recent MIT expert in our extreme weather challenges, so she's probably familiar to you and your students. And um, Svenja does work with marine heat waves. Deb Ahrens is an artist in Massachusetts. Um, she's in um, Dartmouth, Massachusetts, and is joining us from her studio. So thank you all so much for being here. So I will go ahead and hand things over to um, Caroline and Svenja, who are together, as you can see, at Woods Hole, and they'll take it away, and then we'll hear from um, Deb after them. So thank you all. Yeah, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for coming today. Um, it's a pleasure to give you some insights into our wonderful art and science collaboration. Um, this is just uh, a photo from uh, the three of us last year on our first exhibition. And on the top, you see these five close-up um, shots that are um, from these 3D marine heat wave panels that um, Deb created throughout um, our collaboration. And we'll refer back to them um, throughout the talk. And um, as Mary Kate introduced, this is about marine heat waves. And um, I'll explain in a couple of slides what um, these marine heat waves are. So I wanted to give you uh, just a brief overview um, of my scientific journey, which actually started um, in Kiel, Germany, where I did my bachelor's and master's in climate physics. I then moved to a polar research institution in Germany to do my PhD in physical oceanography, which brought me to Antarctica on several research cruises, where I used various observational instruments, um, such as lowered instruments um, from ships, more instruments, but even marine mammals um, to use data, um, to collect data um, to study warm water transport toward the Antarctic um, continent. Um, since 2019, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Woods Oceanographic Institution and mainly use computer simulations of the ocean to study the 3D structure of marine heat waves. So I wasn't going to talk a lot about my science in detail. Um, and give you more of an overview of our collaboration. But then I realized that that's actually how our collaboration started. So we really took the time um, for me to explain my science in a, um, in a comprehensive way to Deb. And Deb was a very careful listener and kind of had to soak it all in um, in the beginning. So as you all know, the ocean is getting warmer. And we know that um, by observing the surface ocean with um, satellites. And since the early 80s, um, um, we, we therefore have a, have a good um, coverage of the global ocean. And here you see um, a time series of the global, global averaged um, sea surface temperature. And there's some variability, but we have this overall warming trend. And we can look at this in a spatial sense. Again, the satellites give us this global coverage. And wherever the, the colors are red, we, the ocean is warming, which is almost in the entire global ocean. There's only very few regions where there's a slight cooling trend where these bluish colors are. And as you can imagine, these warming temperatures, they pose an increased risk to the ecosystem. And this is where marine heat waves come into play. Um, and I'll quickly um, introduce what these events are. So we can look at a synthetic time series of sea surface temperature. And on the left, um, of this dashed line, you, you see a stationary climate, which means there's no trend. There's just some variability about a mean. Um, and we have colder periods and warmer periods. And overall, the ecosystem has adapted to this kind of variability and temperature range that they're experiencing. Every now and then, the temperatures exceed a threshold that we can derive statistically. Um, and then we call these extreme events. But still in the stationary climate, um, species are adapted. Um, to this kind of temperature range. And if they're, for example, migratory, 
um, the fish can just move into a different region where they find a habitat that's um, suitable for them again. In a changing climate with this strong temperature trend, um, we exceed this threshold uh, more frequently. The overall temperatures are becoming more intense and um, we have longer periods of these extreme temperatures. And this is what we then um, call marine heat waves. So they're discrete, prolonged and anomalously warm events. Um, and this will then pose a huge or have a huge impact on the ecosystem because the species they're experiencing temperatures that they've never seen before. Um, and Deb um, incorporated this aspect greatly or beautifully um, in her work. And these are just, again, some, some close-ups. So um, marine heat waves have caused mass die-offs of kelp forests um, of the Western coast of the US or Western Australia. Um, they impact fisheries. So generally marine um, ecosystem services um, so lobster fisheries and squid fisheries here in the Northeast US are, are heavily um, impacted by these extreme events and overall general um, fish um, um, in the region. So this is a map of marine heat waves that we detected using satellite um, data of sea surface temperatures, just to give you an idea what these might look like in the spatial sense. Um, so they can be quite large um, features um, and they're basically everywhere um, in the ocean or in, in the global ocean. And as I said, we can observe the surface ocean quite well with satellites. Um, however, it becomes more difficult if we want to observe the subsurface. Um, and as I said in the introduction already, we have um, various um, tools to do that. So we can use these lower instruments from research vessels. We can use um, sea mammals that collect data for us. We can use drifting and floating devices that kind of profile the, the, the ocean at depth and then come to the surface and transmit the data to satellites. And we can also use autonomous vehicles that kind of zigzag through the ocean and collect data for us. But still subsurface observations are sparse in space and time. And this is why we use computer simulations um, to then an estimate of, they can estimate the global um, ocean circulation and how it changes through time. And they allow us to do more comprehensive analysis of certain features such as marine heat waves. So with all this data that we're collecting, um, this is where our work really starts. We have to come up with research questions. We have all this data and a huge amount of time we spend in front of the computer um, doing code, coding um, using um, specific um, programs. And um, we have to read in the data into the computer. We have to manipulate it, process it, um, do our analyses, and ultimately visualize our data because we need to convey um, our message and our results in a way that other researchers can understand it. So we come up with a whole bunch of different plots, uh, visualizations of our data. Um, that we then have to combine into a story um, to again write scientific papers or give presentations um, to our audience. Um, and so in the end, it's an art of storytelling. And this is a, a big parallel that we found between Deb's work and our work. We have a motivation or an initial question that we want to address. Um, in our case, it's the impact of marine heat waves. What can we learn about the physical mechanisms that drive these marine heat waves? We then collect data or have to see what kind of data is out there already. We use code to manipulate the data, to visualize it. And then we get results such as when did a marine heat wave occur? Where was it? Um, how intense was it? And these res results have then to be kind of analyzed or interpreted in a way that we, they can answer our initial research questions. And Deb did a magnificent job incorporate um, all these different aspects of our work in these 3D um, marine heat wave panels um, and they are telling their own story um, by themselves. Um, and with that, I'm handing over to Caroline. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. Um, so I'll give a brief background of my um, research and um, research interests. So um, with an undergraduate uh, degree in marine biology and physical oceanography um, from the UK and a PhD in applied mathematics focusing on climate modeling, I've really been interested um, for a long time in the water cycle. 
what makes a year be particularly dry, uh, how do rainfall patterns, how do they shift, what uh, causes droughts and floods on land, and how could we better understand and predict them. And it might sound curious why being interested in water resources and rainfall, uh, why I'm at an oceanographic institution rather than at um, an institute focusing on meteorology or uh, hydrology, for example. But it's not if you actually consider where all the water is. So on the right hand uh, figure, and some of you will probably recognize that from the challenges. Um, this is a, an, a picture of the water cycle. And what really stands out if you just focus on the black numbers and the black boxes is where is all the water? 97% of all the water on earth is in the oceans and only a very small fraction is on land or in ice. And the atmosphere actually at any one point in time holds a tiny, tiny fraction of uh, the water. Um, and it only holds it for a very short amount of time. So water cycles through very quickly through the atmosphere and um, that's not really where the memory lies. If we want to better understand or predict something about rainfall on land, we really need to look to the oceans because that's ultimately, no matter how far away from the ocean you are, ultimately the water has come from the oceans. And so I'm really interested in um, the water cycle and the ocean's role in that um, and that transfer from ocean to land. Um, and I'm interested in extreme events droughts and floods, for example. Um, and <clears throat> more so also um, in actually uh, research that is of relevance. When I was doing my PhD in Australia, um, they were going through a, a terrible drought at the time. And um, I was talking to farmers and realizing how much, how much the work that I was doing, trying to understand what drives droughts and floods, how much that mattered to people. And while it was, for me, it was mostly of academic or scientific interest initially, seeing how much it actually matters to people. Um, that really uh, was a very striking insight for me and something that uh, really determined um, my research directions and wanting to study something that is of relevance and that has an impact and that makes a difference to people. And um, with that, it's actually really important what uh, Svenja already um, alluded to, the storytelling and communication. Our research typically ends up in a scientific publication, a scientific journal article, um, and it's being read by our peers. Um, you might get some media attention if you're lucky with a, a paper, but for the most part, that is where that information stays. And that is a shame because the research that we're doing can actually have impacts and can actually make a difference. And as talking to farmers really uh, brought that home to me, that is really where um, the, the key lies in communicating our research. And we need to find creative ways of doing that. And that uh, with the work with Deb has really um, brought that home uh, very clearly. And so I mentioned that I'm interested in droughts and floods, so extreme events. And extreme events are, by definition, are rare. Um, if you want to understand something about the drought of the century or the one in a hundred year flood events, having satellite records that go back 30 or 40 years is really not that uh, helpful. Um, they're great, they're wonderful, they give us global coverage but they don't extend very far back in time. And so to understand something of extreme events that occur only occasionally, even though it might feel lately that they are occurring more often, which is probably true, um, we, we need very long records. And for that, we need good data that extends further back in time. And Svenja already talked about the challenges that we face when we're looking at um, observational data underneath the ocean surface going back in time, but it's not that different actually in, in the atmosphere. So here we're looking at a um, time series of um, the various networks and various tools that we use to observe um, the atmospheric circulation, 
uh, heat uh, transport, moisture transport in the atmosphere. And so since the 1980s, we have satellites that give us good global coverage. Um, but as you're going further back in time, um, the data and the tools that we use becomes faster in time and space and don't give us global coverage and there are fewer of them overall. And so uh, my research tries to extend this even further back in time because um, extreme events are rare uh, by definition. And so we have this mix of observation um, and it's very limited prior to the satellite era and that creates challenges. So what can we do? Well, we use a variety of different ways to extend our knowledge about climate and weather data further back in time. Um, Svenja already mentioned computer simulations um, of the ocean or the atmosphere. So these are one tool uh, to use. Another one are environmental archives. So uh, tree rings, for example, trees, when they grow well, when the climate is good, uh, in a particular year, they might grow a lot and have a very wide ring. When it's dry and hot and they don't grow well, they might only put down a very small narrow ring. And we can track that back in time. Um, and other environmental archives are stalagmites from caves, for example, that also, when it rains a lot, there's a lot of water dripping down into the cave and the stalagmite can grow a lot or when it experiences drought, there might not be any water coming down and uh, no growth occurring. Similar corals also uh, put down growth rings um, similar to trees and so on. And so I work with paleoclimate scientists that study and go into caves and dive to um, get the coral uh, cores and analyze them and try to uh, make a picture of uh, these uh, records further back in time. And most recently, I've also started working with a historian to actually look at weather information from historic records. So um, ship log books contain um, very detailed information about uh, the weather they were encountering, in particular about wind conditions. And one um, set of um, tools that we are actually using are whaling ship log books out of New England whaling ports that um, the whalers of the 1800s back to the late 1700s went all over the world uh, to catch whales. And a unique aspect of that is that uh, they actually went to areas where shipping and merchant um, and Navy ships uh, in the 1800s would not necessarily go. So they were far away from the shipping routes because they went where the whales uh, went. And so what you can see on this map that goes back to 1935, each dot here is a whale that was caught. And so uh, the red uh, represents sperm whales, the blue dots are right whales. And you can see that even the farthest remotest ocean areas were actually covered because the whalers went there because that is where they caught the whales. And so this provides us with a unique set of documents and weather, maritime weather observations that extends our knowledge from what we know from satellites, for example, uh, back by centuries. But all this information is relatively disparate. Uh, we have all these different puzzle pieces, if you want, and we really need to bring them all together and try to spot patterns, try to um, fill in blanks that um, are existing between these very disparate observations that we have in space and time. And um, that brought home some of the parallels in a way that we've seen as we were embarking with this project with Deb between science and art. And in a way, there are a lot of um, similarities we've discovered. Um, we also, our tools might be different, but the process we go through is relatively uh, similar or analogous in, in certain ways. Um, we might be doing 
experiments in a different way. We might be in the science world, we might be experimenting with computer models, while an artist might be experimenting with uh, form or media, different media or um, style, testing color palettes. We are running a computer simulation of testing our hypothesis there. So, um, but also we need to make, um, fill in the gaps that we have in all our data that requires a lot of physical intuition to a certain degree, but a lot of creativity and imagination as well, as we draw a mental picture in a way of how the atmospheric circulation or how ocean circulation works. And so in a way, there are a lot of parallels. And while I overall, as we were embarking on this project, was pretty sure that the outcome uh, would be well worth the um, time and effort in um, embarking on this. What I hadn't realized is how much talking with Deb and thinking about this project would actually tell me about my own science and how much it would actually inform and uh, improve my research because it made me question things that I hadn't thought about before about process. And what I certainly didn't expect was how much fun it would actually be along the way. So it's been uh, really great. And um, with that, I'm going to hand over uh, to Deb um, to talk about her um, perspective on this. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, wherever you are in the world, I am really delighted to be here with you and uh, and to talk about this collaboration. It's been a really unique and wonderful opportunity for me. Um, unlike Caroline and Svenja, uh, I've elected not to use slides during my presentation because I would like to proceed like this is an artist talk. I invite you here into my studio um, where we can sort of feel like we're face to face, even though we're scattered around the globe. My job in this collaboration was to create an artistic representation of this research that you've just had a glimpse into. And I brought to this task a background that includes undergraduate degrees in political science and education, a master's degree in library and information science, and a work career with way too many job titles. Um, I've been a classroom teacher in the US and in Kenya. I was a radio producer. I was a journalist and editor doing public policy research on child and family issues for a decade as a software writer in manufacturing. And finally, I landed in the best career of all, which is artists. And I've been a working artist for the last 10 years. I'm largely self-taught as an artist, uh, but I've taken classes at Rhode Island School of Design and Maine Media College, numerous workshops, and I have an ongoing mentorship with uh, Deborah Quinn Munson, uh, who's a well-known painter here. There is a common thread that runs through my career, regardless of whatever the job title was. and. Um, and that's really that my task has always been to communicate information accurately so that it could be understood, absorbed, and used effectively. And while the medium I've worked in, words, data, radio, sound, color, shapes, uh, at the end of the day, it's all about what needs to be expressed, how is it going to be perceived, and how can I make the presentation stronger and more compelling? Being part of this collaboration uh, has been a real gift to me as an artist and as a human being. It gave me a way to engage with science on a much deeper level than I had in a really long time. Uh, in the early days of the project where they were matching artists and scientists pairs, uh, it was a bit like speed dating. Uh, but I knew that I really wanted to work with Caroline and Svenja because their research has such a connection to my community here in Dartmouth and New Bedford, Massachusetts, both its history and its economic vitality. One of the upsides of the project was that it began just as the pandemic was taking hold. And what that meant was that the initial exhibit plans totally fell apart. So 
without the pressure of an exhibition deadline, I had the luxury of time to really go in depth, gathering information on the what and the how and the why of their research. What are their tools? How do they use them? What's the impact of their research? How do you convey really complex data visually? They sent me articles and books and podcasts to help me understand their work. And we had far ranging discussions, as Caroline said, on the similarity of our processes and how we both need creative and analytical thinking in our work. Having that luxury of time also meant that we had enough time to um, build a really good relationship so that I could really put my journalist hat on and really query deep on the why of what they do. Um, and I remember Caroline saying, no one's ever asked me that question before, but every good book, movie, photograph, or piece of art that it really engages us, it does so because it makes us feel something. And in order to create an artistic representation of the work, I really had to know the why, what motivated them. You may have noticed that in the um, poster for this webinar, the, in the picture of me, I'm wearing a survival suit. And that is not the typical artist headshot you would expect. But I very deliberately chose to send that image to Mary Cat because I really feel that this collaboration has made me an explorer, just like my partner scientists are explorers of the physical world. This project has challenged and deepened my art practice in ways I never could have imagined. Once the research phase of the project was underway, my job became figuring out how to execute this uh, three-dimensional kinetic form that I had no idea how to make. I can imagine easy, but execution. Oh. Prior to this work, most prior to this project, most of my work was two-dimensional imagery in a frame, like you can see a little bit behind me on the wall here. But I really felt that to reflect Caroline and Svenja's work, whatever I made, it needed to be big because they deal with big ideas and big systems and big data, and it had to move, and it had to move in predictable and unpredictable ways. So I spent months experimenting and failing as I grappled with design and materials issues. Um, if I had been a sculptor by training, I might have had CAD CAM software that could help me visualize and problem solve. And if I had been a middle school or high school student, it would have been a great opportunity to learn math and physics and textile design principles. Um, but what I did have was lots of time, thanks to the pandemic. I had time to explore and experiment and to go up and down rabbit holes and to keep problem solving until I arrived at the form that would move the way I want and echo the animations that you saw of these marine heat waves. Our collaboration during this phase was kind of like um, teachers with a student doing independent study. I periodically sent Caroline and Svenja pictures of what I was working on. And when I was really struggling with issues of speed and rotation, Caroline even sent me a video from a car wash so I could see the spinning cloths, which was really pertinent to what I was working on. But once I finalized this heat wave form, our collaboration became more of a peer-to-peer -peer model. We met multiple times to review and revise the content on the heat waves. The computer code has changed multiple times because once then you could see the code on the heat wave, on the prototypes, it sparked ideas for her of other code and other ways we could use it. Another really important collaborative decision that we made was uh, about the narrative structure on the heat waves. Uh, there are five of them, and in the five prototypes, I've made only one that has a single story on it. Uh, it was about the heat wave off the California coast that destroyed the kelp forest. And some of the feedback we got on the project was that it would be better if each heat wave had only a single story. And clearly this is the simple option. But we were all happily 
in real agreement that the issues are so layered, so complex, so interwoven and changeable that mixed storylines were a better reflection of their work and their research. Um, another collaborative uh, step in our journey together came about during the first preview exhibit for this project. Uh, I was on my way to deliver uh, prints, uh, studies that were from the heat waves that were going up on the wall and Svenja and I were taking a walk and it occurred to me that uh, not only had I not put a signature on these prints I was about to deliver and go, were going to hang on the wall, but I had never even thought about signing the fabric sculptures. But once that thought entered my head, I realized that all of our names needed to be on this work. I would never have created this body of work without my partner scientists. So we have our first jointly signed artwork for a first for all of us. In turn, they wrote a grant to NASA to use satellite data in their research on marine heat waves and included a budget for artwork related to the project. Um, the exhibition schedule for this uh, Synergy project is back on track, and we have five exhibitions planned for 2022 and 2023. And as we go forward, uh, thinking about installations in bigger spaces, Caroline and Svenja are writing the content that will hang on water drops interspersed with the heat waves. Uh, this project has been a tremendous gift to me, and I, I could talk for hours about it, but um, I think it's time to turn the conversation back to Mary Kat and hear what you have to say and hear your questions and how we might help you in your and art, art and science collaborations. I would love for our, our attendees to um, keep asking questions, and we have a few that we've received that I'll, I'll kick off our discussion with. From the scientist perspective, Caroline and Svenja, what were your your goals in working with an artist? Um, like, why were you excited to enter this project as scientists and express your research with an artist? Um, yeah, I think um, Caroline um, spoke about it a little bit already in her presentation. I think it's really the the need and the desire to convey the results of our research and the urgency or the impact um, to a broader audience and the general public. It's good to write scientific papers, which you know might be read by our peer colleagues um, who are also physical oceanographers, but ultimately we're all experiencing climate change. We're all experiencing extreme events, droughts, floods, heat waves in the ocean, but also on land. And it's really important um, to find creative ways um, to connect to the general public um, and inform them about our research and why it matters and what we do, what tools we use. Um, and that for me was um, one of the biggest um, reasons to join the collaboration. Yeah, as, as I said, I think communication is key and um, finding lots of different ways and uh, different modes of uh, communicating results um, to a broader audience or an audience that we wouldn't otherwise reach, I think is, is critical. And um, the, the artwork uh, really does that in, in a really wonderful way um, and uh, can have um, impacts in um, addressing and um, conveying the science in a much more approachable and um, fun way than a dry scientific paper might do this. Deb, we have a lot of questions kind of related to an artist learning so much about science and integrating science in the work. One that really relates to our, our audience is, um, how do you encourage a busy art teacher to become inspired by science? So, you know, they, an art teacher has their curriculum ready. They have a lot to go through. They might not naturally be inclined themselves to learn about science, or they may be, why should they work science into their curriculum and bring science to students through art? Well, I think education is about teaching anybody, students or adults, about how to think critically, how to communicate, how to solve problems. Um, and, you know, it, an art teacher doesn't have to 
dive deep into the science to give prompts that would start students thinking about that. You know, they don't have to understand about water chemistry to say, well, let's think about the ocean if it's getting hotter. What does that mean? How do we represent color when it's hotter? How do we represent things that, that are higher and lower? You know, I think there are all kinds of simple ways to uh, incorporate that. I, you know, in my particular case, in this situation, uh, it was a real luxury that I had time to read and go very deep in this project. But I don't think as a busy art teacher, I, I think you can still incorporate all those things. I mean, in climate science and climate is the number one issue for everybody on the planet. So, uh, well, no, that's my, when we turn the recording off, then I'll have a really quick, great answer for <laughs> no, I think you. That's wonderful. I actually really like that. You don't have to have all the answers or the knowledge about the topic. You can ask the question. Um, I think that's a really nice thing to remember for bringing, bringing other topics and collaboration is the discovery is, is part of the process. Uh, um, and that takes us to another question. Really, this is for all of you. I'll, I'll start with um, Caroline and Svenja and then we can move back to Deb. One of our um, guests wants to know, was there a particular moment when you realized the importance of collaborating with disciplines so different than your own? Did you have kind of aha moments or was it was it a gradual process throughout the entire project? I would say it, it was more gradual over the course of the project that we realized, so oh, we are actually um, even Though initially one thinks, well, we need to come up with a common language. We need to figure out what are we talking about um, when we are talking about a model or a hypothesis or about even having observations. What is that? What does it really mean? Um, so coming up with a common language initially um, was um, something, but we pretty quickly realized that there are parallels when I think about um coming up with a mental picture or coming up with the first view of this is how the circulation works or how it might have been changing that that isn't all that distinct from the processes that Deb goes through um and so those were aspects that we realized as we are uh, going along um yeah, and for me, um, kind of, it was a gradual decision, but I actively made a decision to move um, research topic from my PhD to my postdoc, because I wanted something that has more impact on the society. Um, working on marine heat waste, it was kind of a new topic because they popped up all over the world and had devastating impacts. Um, and so I started working on marine heat waves, and then I realized more and more you know, there's no point of me doing this research if I cannot communicate it or connect to um, people outside of science, to fishermen, um, communicate to the power, talk to the public. Um, and so, um, yeah, that was kind of my gradual um, motivation or realization that um, projects like this are very valuable um, in our research. What about you, Deb? Did you have kind of a aha moment of collaboration or any anything that really shines out from the collaborative experience of this process? Um, well, this project Synergy that we are part of, um, this is actually the second uh, round of Synergy. In 2015, there was another collaboration of artists and scientists. And I saw that exhibit. Uh, and I'll never forget there was um, uh, an exhibit by someone who had worked with a scientist and he had done all this videography of eelgrass. And as a kayaker, eelgrass is like a real pain in the butt. And I've never had a good attitude about eelgrass until I saw these videos. Um, so when uh, Art League of Rhode Island said they were gonna do another round of the Synergy Project, I was really thrilled and I was so excited and really hoping that it would work out. And um, so 
seeing the power of the first exhibit and and having seen the public react to this art and science collaboration i i really was hoping that i could be part of it and could contribute something and in this speed dating process that we went through matching artists and scientists um the, one of the reasons I really wanted to work with Caroline and Svenja, aside from the connection to my community, was that both of them really expressed an awful lot of interest and skill already in struggling with how do I communicate my science. Um, Caroline had been uh, in a, a museum exhibit uh, at Boston College on the Indian Ocean, and I spent a long time looking at the video of that exhibit and looking at her presentation, which was a video of the dynamics in the Indian Ocean and the monsoons and how it affects the drought in Australia. And, it, and I watched it over and over again, being really impressed with how that worked. It, it's a very complicated set of principles that are being explained. And it really did it. I was like, okay. This is a this is somebody who's already thinking like that, and and Svenja had won an award for one of her posters she had presented at a conference. And posters are how scientists in this world present their work. They have to take all their research and put it in a twenty four by thirty six piece of paper on the wall and do it well enough that somebody's going to stop and pay attention and absorb something. So I felt like they were we were already very simpatico in that way and having written software that people had to understand and utilize effectively um, i had experience with you know how do you create something so people will understand it and use it and how does it work and how's it going to look on the screen and what are they going to see first and so what's important so that was in my background that i brought to the project um, so you guys, Deb, from what you were saying, you have a lot of similarities actually in your approach to your work and in um, Caroline and Svenja's experience presenting their research and how you, you tackle a project and your goals. So there's a question for um, Caroline and Svenja that's very similar to what we kicked off with with Deb. Um, for science teachers who may be comfortable with their subject matter, but really not feel like they're good at art um, or not comfortable um, creating art themselves, how can they feel comfortable bringing art into their lesson plans and using art to um, to teach science and help their students? It's a tricky question, I think. Um, I think, like Deb said, often you don't need to know all the answers. You just have to start a conversation, um, you know, raise a, a topic or an issue, something that's approachable. Marine heat waves is a great topic, and there, there'll be others, drought, flood, something that people can relate to, and just make the students think of creative ways of how to communicate this issue um, and how it impacts people. Um, and I think you don't necessarily need to bring all the tools, the, the art tools um, into the classroom. Um, you, you just motivate the students, get excited about it and, and let them be creative um, in, in many ways. I mean, when we um, started talking to Deb, I had no idea what the final product, the art product would look like. We just started talking, engaged in a conversation and, and something came, something great came out of it. Um, but you. Um, you don't have to know the end product um, when you start a process like this. And I would say I'm starting out on this process. I wouldn't have considered myself a very visual or um, creative person. Uh, I cannot draw for the life of me, for example. I cannot do sketches or anything like that. But actually, uh, working with Deb on uh, this project and thinking more about color palettes or um, about uh, grade, uh, color gradients or so has really informed my research. I now look at a figure much more critically or in a much different way. And so I think there, um, as, as Deb earlier said, you can in uh, perhaps in the art context say, well, what are hot colors, what are cool colors, how could you convey science that way? I think similarly, from a science perspective, you could say, well, how can we, 
actually look at some of these changes that we are experiencing or some of the um, the mechanisms or processes, how could we use art to enhance that message? Or how could we, how are we communicating um, science? I think science does depend a lot also on visual aspects, which I hadn't appreciated quite as much uh, before this collaboration. But there are um, elements there that actually make a schematic a lot more effective or a lot less effective. And so um, even as we are drawing up um, mechanisms or trying to understand a certain physical or uh, biological process, I think we are subconsciously making choices about how to convey that, that can work better or less well. And those are, even though we might not recognize it, might be perhaps artistic choices that could help us uh, convey something in a better or worse way. So it sounds like this collaboration will really have a big impact on your work moving forward, even your independent work, like the experience of having gone through this. Would you say that that's true? Yes, I, I would say so. And we are hoping to continue this for a long time. I think there's <laughs> lots more complex things to convey and uh, we would hope to uh, keep going with this. Um, so yeah, uh, but so yeah. Do you guys have another, do you have another project in the works? This this uh, successful collaboration here. What do you, what's next? Yeah, I mean, as uh, Deb said, we we actually submitted a grant, to, uh, a proposal to NASA, which got funded um, to use um, sea surface salinity data and, and look at marine heat waves. And Deb is incorporated um, with some budget, so we'll be able to to work with her to again, you know, communicate our results. Um, and we still have as part of this collaboration. Uh, multiple events planned for this year and next year, um, exhibitions, and um, we want to take it a step further further, and uh, come up with some educational material that we can display together with the marine heat waves that goes a bit more into the, or provides more background information about the tools that we use, again, the different instruments, and then, so if people want to learn more about that, you know, we provide some links or QR codes that bring them to more material um, so there's many more ideas um, in our heads that we. So if if we want to see this project, um, how can we kind of stay tuned for what comes out of it from the grant? Well, I think there are um, a couple of ways. One is uh, on on my website. I've got a whole project page about this project, um, and I'll type that into the chat. Um, but also Synergy, which is the umbrella on which we are one of 11 scientist artist pairs. Actually, we're the only triangle. I think that being a triangle has been really wonderful. I think there's a different kind of energy with the three of us bouncing ideas. Uh, I think it's been really wonderful. Um, but uh, I will put that Synergy um, website also on the in the chat, and that's where you can follow uh, where the exhibitions are going to be. And um, so that will continue. I have, there's kind of two related questions that I'd love, we're, we're coming up on time, unfortunately, and we have a bunch of questions we haven't gotten to, and I'm going to try to pull two together. Um, one is wondering, Deb, when you talked about going down rabbit holes and exploring different ideas and, um, how to sort of be crunched for time and have a, have a place that you're going, but wanting to give students the encouragement to fully explore these ideas in art and science and kind of how to best support students in that, which ties into another question um, from a teacher who wants to understand or just get some ideas for how they can encourage students to think differently about big topics in science when they're feeling really stuck, kind of thinking about your story of Eelgrass, does that relate? So how how do you guys think from this collaboration as scientists and artists, we can explore students, you know, encourage students to um, to follow these explorations and get to their goals? Well, I think part of it is that it isn't the end as much as the process that is often important. And I think it's really important for students 
to learn and develop that resilience of you try something and it doesn't work. And so you try, you don't give up. You're not a failure because the first thing you tried didn't work out. You know, you just learn one thing that doesn't work out and you might have to learn 26 more things that don't work out till you get to the 27th. But you know, that, that willingness to just keep on going and to try and to, and to, you know, reward that. Um, and, and I appreciate, you know, teachers have rubrics and deadlines and all of that. So that's, you know, not so easy to implement on a day to day basis. But overall, we want people to grow up with an, a commitment and an understanding and a pleasure in the joy of learning. And a big part of the joy of learning is failing, you know, because that's what you, <laughs> you got to learn what doesn't work till you get to what does work. I think that's an important theme for us as scientists as well. We go down rabbit holes so many times um, and we have these big questions. We're like, we're just going to do this, employ it this way, and then we'll be able to answer everything. And the data just is not enough or it doesn't show us what we expected. Um, and we always have to learn to keep going and go a different direction, step a, big, a, st a, step, a step back, uh, look at the bigger picture again uh, and go a different direction. And even in scientific publications, often only the great results are published, but it's well worth saying things that haven't worked out so other people can learn from it. Um, and we learn from it as well. So you might go down, learn five, 10 different techniques or ways of doing things, but the next time you might approach a very similar project or similar questions um, and you just learn um, from it for the future um, and just try to keep the bigger picture and the motivation in mind um, and don't get lost in the details. Um, there's many different ways um, to get to a beautiful end, um, which, which we don't know in the beginning. Yeah, and to add to that, I think it's something that when students doing a research project or so, I try to convey often, there are 10 different directions that a project could go into. And each one might be equally valuable, but it is almost as valuable excluding some that don't work or are not the path forward. And that is actually being able to eliminate some of those options is almost as a uh, big an achievement is identifying the one or the two or the three that could actually lead forward. And so actually eliminating some options that don't work shouldn't necessarily be a failure. As Svenja said, in our papers, we typically focus on what worked, not what didn't work. But that is also something that I think the community is recognizing and trying to change because uh, those dead ends are um, sometimes as valuable as the ones that are in the rabbit hole and actually get you uh, on the path forward. So once again, thank you, Deb. Thank you, uh, Caroline and Svenja. It's been such a pleasure. Um, we've loved to hear from you and thank you for sharing your experience with everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Bye. Bye.